Okay, let's uh, let's begin in prayer. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O good one, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Okay, welcome. Uh, well, you're going to introduce our speaker this evening. Kelsey, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Father Hezekiah. Our speaker this evening is a Catholic artist, writer, and professor of art, specializing in the intersection of art with theology and spiritual life. His writings on the intersection of art and theology have been published in American Arts Quarterly, the St. Austin Review, the Prosopon and Scene Journals, the Imaginative Conservative, and the Catholic Thing. A lay Dominican holding a master's degree in fine arts and divinity, James Reed has lectured multiple times at the Franciscan University of Steubenville, St. Thomas Aquinas, and at numerous schools and parishes. He has taught at Union College, the New York Academy of Art, and the Art Students League, and is currently on the faculty at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And it's my pleasure to welcome you back again for the second time here at the Institute of Catholic Culture. It's wonderful to be with you tonight. Welcome, Mr. Reed. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Father Hezekiah. And thank you for all those wonderful, wise, and motivating words. Uh, two currents dominate mainstream modern art. On one hand is purely abstract art, which had its heyday in the middle of the 20th century. Such art shows nothing recognizable, yet it can be beautiful. And on the other hand, the more recent proliferation of constructions or images which definitely present things, but ugly, shocking, or offensive things. You can rest assured that I will neither show you nor describe any such ugly, shocking, or offensive art. I will show you one or two purely abstract paintings, nothing offensive. To learn how these different manifestations of modern art came about and see what we can do about the situation, we must first take a look at traditional art and find out why the tradition was broken. Art and the philosophy of nature go hand in hand. When one is corrupted, so is the other. Visual art is itself a way of investigating the world, a wordless philosophy of nature. Art is true, good, and beautiful insofar as it engages deeply with nature. The deepest truth about nature is this. Things exist because God acts within them, creating and sustaining them. And it is he who orders and governs the relations and movements of creatures. All goodness and beauty come from God. As St. Paul told the Romans, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead. Since John Chrysostom, John of Damascus, Bonaventure, and many others, understood these words as referring to the beauty of creation. Beauty in nature is first of all a flashing forth of God's sustaining and governing action within creatures. What Isaac of Syria called the flame of things. It is always there as a delightful splendor to draw us back to God. Art is beautiful, is true to nature, when it touches this mysterious depth in things and magnifies the divine conservation and governance of creatures. This is what happens in traditional art of all ages and cultures. Let's look at exactly how this happens, for unless we understand traditional art, we won't be able to properly evaluate modern art. Every material thing consists of two principles matter and form. Existence comes to a thing through its form, which determines the nature or essence of a thing. 
together with its shape and arrangement. Existence is not static. It is an act. A thing exists because God acts within it, giving it existence from within. A work of art likewise comprises matter and form. An artist who is true to nature so informs his matter, so arranges his clay, paint, stone, or other material, that the resulting work of art is in act. How can a static object, a painting, or a statue be in act? It's done by means of rhythms, rhythms of line, shape, and color. The volumes and shapes must act from within, and all the actions of all the elements must be governed together, choreographed as an organic unity. This is what happens in traditional art. Here is a still life by Chardin, 18th century French painter. In the upper right, there's a large uh, empty area. And then to the left, there is a narrower area of background. The tone of this background moves from light to dark as we go from right to left. And then in this vertical narrow area, the tone gets deeper and deeper and deeper as it plunges down. And then we get a shattering of lights in the reflections in the silver vessel here. And then a, uh, a softer, uh, richer light in the peeled line. And then the light bounces up here onto the glass flask and then up to here and then down here onto the persimmon. And note that this uh, red uh, reflection of the persimmon here parallels this silver reflection. And then we get two uh, fan-like reflections on the persimmon, which direct our eye to the background pair and to the bright foreground green pair. And the, there's a nice color relationship between the great big green pair and the red persimmon. And note the stems here, the stem and that stem rhyming with the reflection of the persimmon. And then the, the warm tone of the background pair leading to the reflection of the persimmon here, which together these give our eye a pathway moving back around the background of the still life, back over to here. So the whole scene is choreographed. It unfolds in space and time. Now looking at uh, something in a very different style, a Persian miniature. Here, note the, uh, the ochre color of the man's tunic and the related but somewhat lighter tone of the garden wall. And then a more muted grayed version of the same color in the background hill, which frames the uh, tree with its pink blossoms. And uh, beyond the contour of the hill, the blossoms become smaller, small blossoms against a blue sky. And this is echoed by the stars in the blue tarp on which the couple sit. And the gestures of the figures are choreographed with the gestures of the tree branches. This, uh, as the woman tilts her head, the vector formed by her head and neck is continued in this branch going up this way. But at the same time, the branch becomes a little bit concave here in response to the vector of the head and neck and turban of the man. And look at what happens here with the uh, tree trunk. It, as it comes down, it pulls down and to the right and leads our eye directly to the joint hands. And it's very important for the design of this painting that the hands are a little bit to the right compared to the vertical lineup of the tree trunk with the uh, with the neck of this vessel, so that we feel the action, the touch, the gentle pull, the gentle tug of, of the hands as he pulls her hand towards him at the same time as, she, as he offers her the cup of tea. 
And here in yet another style is a painting of the entombment of Christ by Rembrandt. Up in the upper right, we see the sunset sky and the tone of that sky gets gradually brighter and brighter and brighter until it pushes against this contour here. And this then sets up our, our sensibility for the, uh, the rhyming shape of the luminous form of Christ and his mourners down here. And then the, uh, the, the winding sheet being pulled up this way, see, pulled up towards this shape of the sky so that we feel the weight of Christ's body and the exertion of the, of, of the, the figures here by the way that Rembrandt has choreographed his tones. And also, if we follow the, uh, the light on Christ's legs down here, we come to another group of mourners and then over to the lantern over here. And this then, see how the lantern is full, fully down here at the lower end of this stretch of dark space. So that gives us again the feeling of weight pulling down here and we get then a triangular relationship of lights from here to here to here. And the light is at its greatest, of course, over here. So we feel the pull of the action over to this way, climaxing in the, the dead Christ and the mourners here. At the same time, Rembrandt wraps the darkness around up here into this foreground figure to frame the scene. I think we can agree that these three examples of traditional art are all beautiful. Their shapes and colors unfold rhythmically, organically within each work. And they do not stop, but continue to unfold toward the viewer to illuminate the soul of the viewer and provoke a reciprocal expansion, a going forth of the soul toward the beautiful. This expansive unfolding of the artwork is felt as a kind of radiance. St. Thomas Aquinas called it claritas. It is the hallmark of beauty. But if you go to an exhibition of mainstream contemporary art, such as the Whitney Biennial, you will likely see things that don't do this. So what happened? A rejection of the perennial philosophy of nature is what happened. It happened gradually with the rise of materialism, the philosophy known as positivism, denial of the metaphysical depth of nature in which God acts. Already in the second half of the 19th century, art suffered from the general loss of appreciation for deep form. Art was in many cases reduced to a superficial copying of appearances. Paintings were praised for looking like photographs. Proper human vision was rejected and mechanistic vision was exalted because of a change in philosophy along with an increasing mechanization of life in general. A shortcut method of drawing and painting came into vogue and was taught in the academies and in manuals. Artists grew up ignorant of the thorough rhythmic structuring a masterpiece requires. Once materialism pervaded the culture, it infected even religious art. The beliefs or intention of the artist made little difference if his artistic formation was faulty. An artist intent on making a painting of the entombment of Christ, instead of, like Rembrandt, inventing an integral structure in which every line and nuance of tone is choreographed so that the whole unfolds rhythmically and organically, might pose models and copy their appearances arranging the figures on the canvas with a view to telling the story, but failing to account for the divine conservation and divine governance. The result is a frozen image, resembling a movie still or a photograph of a tableau vivant. Now, there are many things to like in this picture by Jacques Tissot. You and I can appreciate its details of costume, setting and facial expression. This picture can help us to imagine a sequence of moments in the story, much like a motion picture. In fact, a silent film was made based on Tissot's paintings. 
As film, it works, but as painting, it goes only so far. We have to acknowledge what differentiates this work from traditional art if we are to understand how modern art came about. The Rembrandt is experienced kinesthetically in terms of movement and rhythm. The forms act. This painting on the right by Tiso is inert. Squint now at these pictures so you don't distinguish figures and objects, just shapes of various tones. In the Rembrandt, you still feel movement, light, space, and dynamic tension. The shapes are organized. When you squint at the Tiso, the shapes, lines, and tones are seen to be random, confused, and incoherent. They are entirely byproducts of the rendering and have no logical arrangement in themselves. They do not act together. If you look at both paintings from 30 feet away, the Rembrandt expands toward you like a grand melody, whereas the Tiso remains on the wall like static. Now, if you can't see this difference between Rembrandt and Tiso right away, don't worry. As with music, literature, and liturgy, it usually takes time to learn to perceive superior forms. Our senses, internal and external, require gradual training. Here's the, the entombment as painted by Raphael. You can't think of a Raphael painting as a moment in a film. It bears no resemblance to a photograph. Moreover, everything is consummately organized so that it bears the imprint of eternity. See how the uh, Raphael has the contour of the sky scooping down like that, somewhat like the way that Rembrandt had it. And again, that scoop of the sky is echoed in the shape of the body of Christ. Also note how the, the weight is held in tension with this straight vector, this line which is created by uh, Mary Magdalene's sleeve here, which if you follow that through, it leads directly to the blue mantle of Our Lady here. And then the red shapes up here are held in tension with the red down here. See how all of the heads and limbs are choreographed. For example, how from this head to this head, we get one interval, and then the interval is a little bit larger from this head to this head, and is larger still from this head to this head. So you get a rhythmic sequence, and that kind of rhythmic sequences can be found in every relation of uh, head and limb throughout the painting. The painting is all present at once. Past and future are subsumed in eternity. This is a crucial aspect of the way a traditional masterpiece joins everything together in unity and points to God's action in nature. All of God's actions are eternal, even if their effects are temporal. The Tiso painting, in comparison with the Raphael, is evanescent. It has no sustained presence. This is the opposite of traditional art. This problem is not peculiar to Tiso. I'm showing his work because it exemplifies a prevalent modern phenomenon. This new way of making paintings to represent a story uh, as if it were a, a still from a, from a movie, or as if it were simply a tableau vivant, is a break with traditional art. It was the beginning of modern art in the sense of art overtaken by corrupted concepts. We might not see the problem because we like all of the uh, detailed rendering in the picture. And we like the story, of course, but a great decline has occurred. And most art following this is either a continuation of the decline 
or a reaction to it. Again, don't feel bad if you like Tissot's picture. I have a book of Tissot's Bible pictures and I can enjoy them. Whenever the Brooklyn Museum has displayed any of them, I've made a special trip to see them. They are good for stimulating a certain kind of cinematic imagination, which has value. But let's not confuse such pictures with traditional art, which deals more with the breadth and length and height and depth of divinely ordered reality. It might be easier to see the difference from tradition if the pictures represent less emotionally charged subject matter, something about which, which one would not make a film. Uh, but before we go on to less emotionally charged subject matter, I'll just show you one more entombment that is by Tintoretto. And again, you can see that the painting is choreographed, how the, the, the movement down here is balanced by the movement up here. Here's a still life painting by the 19th century Dutch painter, Henk Boss. The existence of these objects does not happen in the painting. There is no event, no rhythmic organic unfolding of lines, shapes, and tones, no magnification of the act of existence, the divine conservation of creatures. The things are taken for granted as if they simply appeared gratuitously by magic, not sustained by the continuous pulse of God's action within them. They are shown as in a frozen, lifeless instant, not as energized and choreographed within God's eternal providence. By contrast, here's an ancient Roman uh, still life, a, a fresco, a wall painting. See how rhythmic the shapes are. Or look at Chardin's still life with peaches. I won't spend time analyzing this particular painting because I have a, a YouTube video dedicated to this painting, which you can watch at your leisure. Here you see the Chardin and the Henk Boss side by side. See how the, the Chardin painting moves within itself. It's, it's musical. It's like a dance. All the tones and shapes are choreographed, so it has an expansive power. The, the Henk Boss painting is inert. It seems to shrink away from us. And here's the self-portrait by El Greco. See how El Greco choreographs this painting. On the left, there is a triangle here made by the fur of his coat and then a portion of a parallelogram, and then a vertical panel of fur here, and then a triangle, uh, one side of which is vertical, the other side tilts over this way, and then we have this panel of fur joining another triangle, which surmounts a trapezoid down here. So all of these are geometric shapes. They're not copied from appearance, they are shapes invented by the artist. And uh, up here, see how this, as the fur turns over his shoulder, the tone changes, and it then leads our eye into the background. And note that the head itself tilts, this ear and this eye are higher than that eye and that ear. And so this fanning motion that we saw down here follows through in the tilt of the head. And the luminosity which increases as it points up into the dome of the head is balanced by the, uh, the white rough collar that he has. And as our eye is led around up this way and back down this way, as the tone of the background deepens coming back down this way, then this dark, this boundary between dark and light on the fur, parallel to this edge down here, bring our eye back in and then note how the contour of the beard comes in like this in response. So in a great masterpiece, in, in, the, in the Raphael we saw, in the Rembrandt, in the Persian miniature, in the Chardins, 
everything happens together. For every action, there's an equal and, opposite, equal and opposite reaction. Everything depends upon everything else. Everything is interlocked in a providential arrangement. Nothing is left to chance. Nothing is accidental. Nothing is fortuitous. Nothing is simply there without any reason. Um, here's the head of Adam from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling. The whole head is developed rhythmically and volumetrically. And this becomes very evident if we compare it with a, a modern attempt by an artist to paint that head of Adam more realistically. Uh, so the head on the right is photographic. The Michelangelo's head of Adam is not photographic. But see how this, the head of Adam by Michelangelo is very much alive. It, uh, see how, for example, this, the contour of the neck, how it pulls out this way. We feel the pressure of the internal, of the muscles against the skin here. And this contour here then dances with the contour of the hairline, with the contour of the brow ridge, and with the contour of the eyelid. In this modern rendition, and the artist certainly had to work very hard to paint this photographic looking rendering, the image is inert, it's frozen, it's lifeless. When we look at a Byzantine icon, like this icon of St. John the Baptist, we see that it is like the El Greco and like Michelangelo's Adam, in that all of the strokes of light and dark and color are rhythmic. And uh, look at the, the, the lines on the cheeks, how they rhyme with the lines, the shapes of the ear. Uh, so your eye can continually travel round and around on this image uh, as, a, as you would follow a melody in time. Okay, here's a close-up of that head of St. John the Baptist. Even the curls of the hair and beard and the hairs of his uh, shirt are all rhythmically uh, created. And there's, of course, also the more geometrical rhythm in his uh, robe here. When we look at the El Greco and the Byzantine icon and the Michelangelo, we see how they are all in the tradition. And the modern photographic rendering is outside the tradition. It's something else. And now we'll compare also with these a, uh, a Russian icon of St. Uh, Nicholas. And again, it's, it's rhythmically constructed. Uh, and, and note how the, uh, your eye goes up and around to the right and then down on this side and then, then down to the homophorion. And then we feel with special uh, intensity, the blessing gesture of the hand next to the red uh, of the, the gospel book, which he's holding. And down here, is a portrait by Vincent van Gogh. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about this because van Gogh, in painting the portrait, felt it all as a rhythmic event in time and space. The background changes tone as it comes around and down, and then that yellowish tone leaps forward onto the neck and becomes brighter. This white collar comes down, the other white collar goes up, pushed up by the red cravat, and then this, the green uh, lapel swings up higher on this side than on that side. And the face kind of warps out this way a little bit, you see? And then we get the redness here picking up on the red of the cravat and leading our eye up to the red of the ears. Uh, see how active the eyebrows and eye sockets are as this eye socket pushes in towards the bridge of the nose. 
and this uh, uh, eyebrow holds the space up here and how the tilting down of the hat on this side is answered by the flow of the blue visor across and the wisps of hair coming out like that. Note that wonderfully active shape of the nose pulling out this way as it's choreographed with all of the other forms. Now, the Vincent van Gogh was one of the painters at the beginning of the modern era. And uh, he worked largely in the mode of line and flat tone. You don't see as much subtle modeling in light and dark as you would find, say, in the Rembrandt. But this treatment of painting in terms of line and flat tone is the same thing that you see in Russian icons. The sense of movement or kinesthesis is the key to all the old masters, to all traditional art. The end of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century saw a great effort to recover this perennial worldwide tradition of kinesthetic form together with an implicit and sometimes explicit rejection of the corrupted materialist concepts which had weakened pictorial form in the preceding century. Among others, the German sculptor Adolf Hildebrand, the father of the great philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand, called for a return to form on the basis of the kinesthetic nature of vision and wrote an important book on the topic. The painter Hans Hoffmann was influenced by Hildebrand's insights and was himself in turn influential with his teaching and writing about the action of form. Here's another painting by Chardin, the 18th century and hence very traditional French painter. And we can appreciate the beautiful rendering in this painting. Here is a painting by the 20th century French painter Henri Matisse. Now Matisse revered Chardin, but he also admired Van Gogh and was very enthusiastic about Russian icons. And like Van Gogh and the Russian icon painters, Matisse painted in the mode of line and flat tone with very little or no shading. You might say his work is more reduced to the abstract than Chardin's work. The kinesthetic rhythms we've pointed out in the old masters can be considered the necessary abstract quality of their work, rooted in a true philosophy of nature and in the requirement of beauty. Post-Renaissance artists managed to achieve seemingly realistic rendering without any loss of abstraction. But the best modern artists, aiming above all at the most essential formal qualities of the masters, simplified or sacrificed rendering in their pursuit of movement and space because they realized they were unlikely to attain both this essential quality that I've been pointing out and subtle rendering at the same time. That combination had been lost. But Matisse and Picasso revered the old masters and studied them ceaselessly. So in this painting by, by Matisse, yes, it's simplified. Yes, it's rather abstract. It doesn't have the beautiful subtle rendering of Chardin but it is thoroughly choreographed. So every note of color, every nuance of line happens at just the right time, at just the right place in the rhythmic unfolding of the whole. Look at, for example, at this plate of fruit down here and see how the white of the plate intensifies over to the left here. So we feel a pull back in this direction. The red fruit back here is answered by the red and green fruit up here. So this fruit calls to that fruit and the green fruits take their place between them. So it's all unfolds very logically. And then this leaf pulls down this way 
And then we get a stem that pushes up this way, and then a cluster of leaves, like that. So together they form a kind of bow and, and arrow structure. Here's the bow, and here's the arrow. If we follow the direction of that arrow, it leads up here to the handle of the pitcher. And so the pitcher handle is where, the way it is, the shape it is, where it is, because of its relation with the bow and arrow. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. None of this happens by accident. And as proof, Matisse repeats the same motif with a variation over here. Here's the bow, here's the arrow, here's the handle of the teacup. And in this case, then, the saucer, the underside of the saucer pulls to the right, and the top of the teacup pulls to the left. It is, in fact, pulled by its magnetic attraction to the blue up here, the large blue shape, uh, just as in the, in, in the heavens, a larger planet has a gravitational pull upon a smaller planet. And up here we have a blue field with white lines in it. Here's a smaller blue field with white lines in it. So our eye is pulled from here to here. And in the process then, the uh, bunch of ivy here moves in moves leftward. And then this red shape pushes back against the, uh, the pitcher here to stabilize it. So all of these things are going on. Now, if we look again at Chardin's still life, we can see how Chardin is choreographing his painting. The background is lighter here, it's getting darker over here, and then the dark plunges down, and that, and, and that uh, it comes in tandem with this rectangle of tone here, which comes down and pushes down the bowl of the pipe, which then causes the stem of the pipe to go up like that, much like a seesaw, it comes down on this side, so it must go up on that side, and lo and behold, we follow the, that stem of the pipe and we come into the handle of this pitcher. So it's the same kind of composition as we saw in the Chardin. Uh, now, Matisse loved to go to the Louvre and study and actually copy the Chardin. So I, I'm sure that that's where M Matisse got his idea for his composition. But it's the same kind of thinking that's going on. None of these artists were copying appearances. They were constructing visual melodies. Now, we can see the movement, the abstraction in Chardin more clearly now because our eyes have been educated by studying the Matisse, in which there was no virtuosic rendering to distract us from the essential abstraction. Chardin was not copying appearances any more than Matisse was, but with our modern habits of vision, we are likely to assume he did and stop short of experiencing the pictorial music, the richness of Chardin's abstraction. If we study the works of Matisse and Picasso, they will teach us how to see the old masters truly. Pure abstraction in art is nothing new. It has always been found everywhere as ornament or decoration. What is new in the 20th century is the autonomous abstract painting framed to hang on a wall. Pure abstract art in this sense is partly a reaction to the loss of tradition. If people make representational paintings without abstraction, like the Tissot entombment or the, the modern version uh, of, of the head of Adam, then other people make abstract paintings without representation to counterbalance the error, so to speak. This collage by Matisse moves. Uh, look, look at how coming in from the left, we have the beige tone here, and then the pink tone, and then this deep, rich rose color, which comes off of the pink and slides over to the right and joins then with this black shape, which pushes up against it. And see how the rose shape tilts like that. And then we get the black shape reappearing and coming down here, and then a repeat 
of the pink tone. This time, it's narrower than over here. It gets squeezed, squeezed against the complementary green. And then we meet the intense rose color over here again. And then the expansiveness of the field over here with its deep, rich blue here with this kind of ghost-like white form pushing out against the yellowish frame. Uh, it, and then, of course, from this rose, deep rose, our eye comes back over to that rose, and our, we can continue to travel around back and forth uh, among all of these shapes, appreciating things like the way that this contour here rhymes with this contour here. So far, I've talked about modern art of the first half of the 20th century and how the modern artists then were trying to recapture the perennial worldwide tradition of art. But what happened after the middle of the 20th century? A decline occurred, another decline. In the long run, both perception of form and metaphysical worldview are needed if good art is to be made and valued. Piety and training in philosophy and theology do not help in art without a proper education in the art of seeing. On the other hand, formal awareness will die out in the culture if it does not lead to acknowledgement of God, just as many other values cannot survive forever in a faithless materialist society. Then, sooner or later, art slides into formlessness, which is what has generally happened over the past 60 years. What is unsupported cannot long stand. The alertness to form insisted upon by the early modern masters has been waning since the middle of the 20th century. Matisse and Picasso expressed a deep disappointment in what a lot of modern art turned into. Matisse told an interviewer in 1953, just write down exactly what I told you. Matisse is against abstract art. Picasso thinks exactly as I do. And Picasso himself said to his friend, the journalist, Hélène Parmelin, quote, we must kill modern art. Now, Matisse was not condemning all abstract art, obviously. He made beautiful abstract art himself. He was against abstract art born of corrupted concepts. The following words from him make this clear. And now I'll quote from Matisse. One starts off with an object. Sensation follows. One doesn't start from a void. Nothing is gratuitous. As for the so-called abstract painters of today, it seems to me that too many of them depart from a void. They are gratuitous. They have no power, no inspiration, no feeling. They defend a non-existent point of view. They imitate abstraction. One doesn't find any expression in what is supposed to be the relationship of their colors. If they can't create relationships, they can use all the colors in vain. Rapport is the affinity between things, the common language. Rapport is love. Yes, love. Without rapport, without this love, there is no longer any criterion of observation. And thus, there is no longer any work of art. This painting by Frank Stella, is like the still life by Hank Boss I showed you earlier, in that both are gratuitous. Things like this are relatively harmless, however. Art has gotten much worse to the point where a lot of so-called art is just pornography and hateful propaganda. I won't show any examples because I would never show you ugliness. So let's put Matisse's collage back up here as we accentuate the positive. With proper education, beauty will flourish. There are even today many artists, though a minority in the art world, 
who have a feeling for form and sincerely try to make beautiful art, whether representational or purely abstract, and some of them make wonderful art. Artists who aspire today to revive the true classical tradition of Raphael and Rembrandt have a very noble intention. To succeed at this most difficult task, they must attend to the deep formal requirements of that tradition, the requirements of kinesthetic form according to the divine conservation and governance of creatures. All the forms must act from within as God acts within all of his creatures to sustain them in, in existence. And everything must be choreographed, governed, as God governs his creation providentially. But reviving the shortcut approach of 19th century materialism, which believed in simply copying appearances as a camera would do, doesn't help matters, but rather perpetuates the problem. Traditional art is worth struggling to revive for artists, connoisseurs, and the appreciative public. This involves, among other things, patient study of the best works which modern art produced, most of it before 1960. Cezanne, Van Gogh, Matisse, and others can teach us to see, feel, understand, and appreciate the action of form in Raphael, Michelangelo, Rembrandt, and the rest. Thank you. And I will welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Reed, for um, that really remarkable presentation. Um, I feel like I've like walked out into bright sunlight after being in a dark room for a long time. And I think I don't quite know how to process all that you've really like revealed in this presentation. I have to say, I'm really thankful we have this recorded so I can go back and rewatch it and kind of take in these, these concepts again. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. My pleasure. And it looks like we have lots of questions coming in here. So, let me see, are there any um, video participants that have a, a question of Mr. Reed? Okay, Martin, yeah, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and I'm gonna sort through these other ones that came in through the box. Um, Mr. Reed, uh, is it fair to say that, uh, I'm trying to, to distill what, what you explained to us, is it fair to say that that traditional art, as you put it, is has movement. It tries to, or it does depict movement. And at the same time, it's orderly, like the universe, uh, not haphazard, not um, a uh, just a collection of objects or you know shapes, but ordered like the universe and in motion like the universe. Is that, does that capture something of what you're saying? Yes, indeed. Yes, you summed it up very well. All right. Um, we had two questions come in that are related. Um, so I'm going to just kind of combine them into one. Um, Anna Lee is writing in and she is saying, um, like, it, it seems that you're saying with the tr traditional arts that nothing's accidental and everything has a purpose. And she's struggling with how does one learn to recognize the story that's being told through these paintings and to come to see, like as you were describing, all the different movement and aspects of the paintings that we saw. How does one come to see that? And then kind of related to that, Catherine is writing in and she's wondering if you know of any initiatives uh, specifically for children and parents looking to instruct their children in the, the truth, beauty, and goodness um, of art? I think the most important thing is to expose children to beautiful art from the very early age, have beautiful art for them to look at. Because uh, children naturally tune into these things. Uh, 
it, Henri Matisse used to say that in order to be an artist, one must learn to look at life with the eyes of a child, uh, uh, regaining childhood's freshness upon contact with objects uh, and not let, let oneself be cut off by the existence of objects, from the existence of objects, the way that uh, adults often are. Because as we, as we grow up, we tend to develop a more utilitarian approach to life. and We lose that sense of wonder. Children find wonder, joy, and delight in colors, in shapes, in textures. They naturally pick up the rhythms in a picture. And uh, so if, if children are exposed to beautiful art from very early on, they'll simply grow up with it and they will then have an eye for it. It's the same as with music. If they listen to beautiful music from early on, then they will not tolerate bad or ugly music. Um, I think Paul, one of our video participants has a question. Paul, do you still have your question? Would you like to unmute yourself? Sure, thank you, Mr. Reed, for your uh, uh, presentation tonight. I had a question for you. Um, would you then, or would it be correct to summarize that as society moves more to postmodernism, to atheism, uh, towards the removal of God, that the culture suffers, that the art suffers? We can see that in literature, film, architecture. Would you say the same thing for art, works of art? that by removing God from our lives, there's a great uh, negative effect that we suffer. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, it's interesting that among the artists of the early 20th century who were trying to regain the perennial tradition of art, uh, most of them talked a, a lot about God, about spirituality. Um, but, uh, uh, however, most of them, they, they were not, uh, well, some of them were, were really religious. Cezanne, for example, was devoutly Catholic. Uh, Balthus, uh, became devoutly Catholic. Uh, Georges Rouault was devoutly Catholic. But then others like, uh, Hans Hoffmann, who wrote a great deal, taught a great deal about the action of form in art, was more generally pantheistic in his beliefs, although his, uh, his, his widow claimed that he died a, a believing Catholic. So, uh, but um, but the, the, so, so the, the attention to the activity of form in art often goes hand in hand with religious faith. And when faith is lacking, artists, there can still be artists who are unbelievers, who simply because of their, their love of great art, they can, they can still produce beautiful art themselves and appreciate it and tell the difference between good art and bad art. But the culture, when the culture as a whole declines, that tends to affect artists too. And it, I think now, and increasingly is going to take a strong faith and a, a right philosophy of nature, coupled with training in vision to keep art alive and flourishing. Thank you for that beautiful response. Um, I think I noticed Lorraine, um, and I see you too, Hannah, but Lorraine, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself. I had a question to follow up on on Paul's. I was think I found myself in the middle of the the Matisse. I was thinking about some of the works of um, Kandinsky and others in the Blau Reiter group that a sort of balance and rhythm and colors acting you know colors acting against each other and with each other in different ways across um, a, an abstracted form or, or landscape, and how that was in the same philosophical bend with Schoenberg and others who were reinventing what tonality meant or didn't mean. And I was wondering in a, from a philosophic point of view, when all of those artists at that time, musical and artistic work, were really um, steeped in the old masters, like you were saying, and really still working within 
these form and rhythm and construction and um, and composition in, in real ways and counterpoint and so on. Um, but then whose philosophy had rather disastrous results within a generation um, mm -hmm. or or their attitudes towards folk music that, that went other ways. How do you balance the enjoyment or the existence of those individual works of art within in the ways in which they reflect all of the principles that you were talking about versus where they led us ultimately in the 20th century. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but I guess I'm, I'm just sort of asking in a larger context where, where that goes. Hmm. Well, there are, there are always many different influences, many different currents of thought swirling around. And uh, Kandinsky and the Bell writer artists and Schoenberg uh, took much from tradition and they also were playing with ideas which were not necessarily too helpful. Uh, uh, Kandinsky was into theosophy and well, the, the, theosophy was good insofar as it acknowledged the spiritual world, acknowledged that there's a spiritual dimension to things. And, and that was very important for Kandinsky's art as it is for art in general. However, when there is not faith of, of a, when there's not the true faith, there is danger of everything going downhill because with, and I go into this in an article that I wrote for the Catholic thing a year or two ago about divine providence in relationship to art. The world is not picture perfect. Uh, things die, things decay, terrible things happen. So I, I didn't bring this up in my talk tonight because I wanted to keep things simple because of shortness of time. But there is this, this deeper issue, which I go into in, in other talks and in, in other writings. And uh, with the terrible things that happen, all the pain and destruction, all the results of the fall. I did not talk at all about the fall. The fall requires a, and calls for a, what the pagan poet uh, called the a need to rework the sorry scheme of things entire. But that only happens through the action of Christ. Christ makes all things new through his passion, through, through the pain he suffers. And uh, that too, that the, the, the reworking of all things, the shaking up of things, the, the earthquake of Good Friday, in which the old comes to an end and all things are made new, this also is reflected in the work of art because the artist must re completely rearrange the materials to make the work of art. And if, if God is not redeeming, if God does not redeem the fallen world, then the creation of beautiful works of art in which everything comes together perfectly and is fully resolved, then that's fantasy. In a world that remains fallen, beautiful art is fantasy. It's escapism. It's an ivory tower. And so without belief in the incarnation and the redemption, the death and resurrection of our Lord, without belief in that, there is ultimately no, no hope. And so if, if beauty then is escapism, then it's no wonder that our current atheistic society has rejected beauty. 
it, it, it sees no point in it. I'm glad, so I'm glad you asked that question because it uh, gave me the, this opportunity to uh, point out how this, how the plot thickens. Great. Hannah, do you still have your question? Yeah, I do. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on um, the ability of purely abstract art to convey some kind of a spiritual meaning. And I'm specifically thinking here about like um, the color field paintings in the Rothko Chapel, like those were intended to convey some kind of a spiritual meaning, but at the same time, they still don't seem to have that same kind of um, flow to the traditional art you were talking about. Well, I find those, the paintings of Mark Rothko, uh, I find them very simple. I don't find in them the, the richness that I find in Matisse and Cezanne and Rembrandt and Tintoretto and the rest. Uh, I think they're, I think they're okay, but I don't find any deep spirituality in them. Um, now, can purely abstract art convey spirituality? I think it can, it can provide a kind of background maybe for spirituality. Uh, and, and that's what the abstract decoration does in tr the traditional design of, of churches. Uh, and in, the, in all of the wonderful decorative work on medieval manuscript pages. Uh, but those manuscript pages always also contained images, uh, uh, representational art. Uh, because again, we, we need the incarnation. We, uh, we can't live in a purely abstract realm. We need everything, we need, uh, well, representational art has to be thoroughly abstract, but it is richer and deeper if it is also representational at the same time. Uh, I think that purely abstract art is in a way impoverished compared to the fullness of abstraction in the traditional representational art in Raphael, in, uh, in Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. And uh, there was a 20th century French devoutly Catholic painter named Jean Bazin, who uh, was himself a, a, an abstract painter. All of his work was abstract, but he himself said that the, uh, he said that we must learn to dissociate the abstract from the non-representational uh, because he wanted, he was pointing out that great representational art is thoroughly abstract at the same time as it's representational. And he said that the greatest height of abstraction ever reached in the history of art was in the work of Jan van Eyck. Now, Jan van Eyck was a, uh, a Renaissance Flemish painter who did the most detailed renderings that have ever been painted. Uh, I think his most famous painting is perhaps the Arnolfini wedding portrait that's in the National Gallery in London. And there's his, his marvelous painting in the Louvre of the, the Virgin and Child with uh, Chancellor Roland. Chancellor Roland was the donor of the painting and he's shown praying to the Virgin and Child. And uh, in that painting, every, you can practically see every thread of the fabric of his rich uh, vestments. And you can look out the window and see the distant river and the bridges across the river and the people on the bridge and the, the windows and the buildings across the river. And it's a tiny painting. And uh, uh, that, but as Jean Bazin pointed out, Van Eyck was probably the most abstract artist who ever lived. So uh, 
that's the height of painting is, I think, when a painting can be wonderfully representational and thoroughly ordered rhythmically at the same time. Is that, because that's the way the world is, that's the way God's creation is. So if we, if we try to represent things without that, without that rhythmic organization, what I call the abstract, or if we make abstract paintings without the representation, without the images of God's world, in either case, we've taken it apart and we have a part of the whole. And uh, I think that kind of fragmenting of the whole is what we're largely dealing with now. That's the problem. We need to put it back together. But that's very difficult. It, it's, uh, it, it's almost miraculous when it happens. There's something miraculous about all those old masterworks.